Mm -hmm. All right. Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can hear me and see the screen? All right, great, thanks. Okay, so the problem set's due uh, this evening and we'll have the next problem set due next Wednesday. So we got shifted a bit. Um, and otherwise, any questions from what we did last lecture? Did we do last lecture? Was it pet? So we did last lecture. Yeah. Any any questions on that? Okay. We'll we'll launch straight into CT, <clears throat> which is uh, one of my favorite topics in cardiac imaging. Uh, let's hide that. Okay. Great. <clears throat> so uh, again, a lot of the material will come out of the Bushberg textbook and some from prints and links, which those of you, if you've taken 280, that was the course, yeah? Not. Oh, the projector's not on, thank you. Well, that is locally a problem. Thank you very much. Perfect, okay. Um, okay, and so we're, we're going to do a few lectures on CT because even though in the United States it is not the method of choice for cardiovascular imaging, uh, this time 10 years from now or 15 years from now it will be, and uh, it is in Europe and it is in, in the UK and Canada and places like that where actual sort of uh, rational balance is used for healthcare. Uh, design as opposed to a free market system. So um, uh, we're, you'll see a lot more of it. By the time you need it, you, it will be widespread because <laughs> you're right at the right age, right? So <clears throat> uh, again, you know, we're getting used to this. Um, let me see where my is. We're getting used to this configuration of medical imaging equipment, which is like a donut, right? And so you have a cylinder with about a meter wide bore. Uh, and uh, the patient rolls through uh, that donut. They can roll through continuously, or you can stop and scan some spot and then move them to a different location and scan that spot if you want. I'm not sure what you're saying. Well, I understand perfectly well. What is your problem? Does anyone know how this happens? Do you, do you got any of you guys have one of these goofy watches? No, I got this for Christmas. And uh, every once in a while, she just randomly asks me a question. So like, I don't know if it's a design feature, uh, whatever. So um, this, this guy is gonna undergo, he looks about the right age to undergo a cardiovascular exam. You know, by the time you're in your 50s, 50% 50 of people have some kind of cardiovascular disease in their coronaries. Like you have calcium and lesions are growing and stuff like that. Uh, this tech is putting on, or is about to put on under the shirt, uh, an ECG lead. And so while the exam is being done, an ECG is obtained. And then wherever data is obtained, they record the ECG and they, so you know exactly where that data was obtained in the cardiac cycle, right? Um, <clears throat> and so that, that's a continuous uh, readout. This machine here, is a, it's called a power injector. And as opposed to somebody holding a syringe and pushing contrast into the patient, this machine can generate enough pressure to get that contrast into a decubital vein, which is right about here. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna put a catheter or a, a, a needle in there and uh, it'll push the contrast in there at about five mil, mils per second anywhere from four to eight mils per second, something like that. And uh, there's two uh, vials here because one will be full of contrast agent and the other will be full of saline. And so when you push the contrast in, you don't want a bunch of contrast sitting in the superior vena cava and the vein because it's just sitting there. So after you push the contrast, you then push a certain volume, say 50 cc's of saline behind it which pushes it downstream to get it into the into the heart, into the body. 
this uh, injector is controlled from the scanner console. So the tech uh, has a separate control panel. It's not usually integrated into the system for some reason. It's a usually a different company like MedRad or something provides this thing. And then they work with the scanner company to link you up so that the logic works out right. And then you, you push the controls on this thing to get the injection going. Then you push the controls on the CT scanner to start acquiring data. <clears throat> Um, the, what else is, is done? Then you, uh, depending on what part of the patient's anatomy you want to image, there's usually a set of laser, uh, lights on here that you can align the patient appropriately, uh, uh, with respect to the lasers, at least to get a very good zero order approximation to where you're going to start your scanning. Okay. And, um, however, Scout scans are the first thing that's performed. So you you essentially run the patient. If you're going to do their heart, you'd run them from here to about down here through the imaging bore while you while the gantry is rotating, and you just take a, a broad projection picture of low, a low dose projection picture of where the patient is, where their diaphragm is, where their heart is, etc. And those are then used to uh, align to first order the the thing that you want to scan. Um, the this is the time consuming part of the process. This takes maybe four minutes of the text time, and you know another time consuming process is getting the patient from the waiting room into here and you know, all that kind of stuff. The scan itself can take 150 milliseconds, right? So all of this business about how do you set up patients to get you know on data in efficient manner is is uh, still being worked on certain cultures like in beijing they can do 3x if not 4x times the number of patients that we do here right because they have this part super efficiently designed and so you just have a, a essentially a scanner that does four times as many patients as we do here um, so <clears throat> inside this, uh, cylindrical donut or torus here, you will, we'll, we'll take a peek inside there and we'll see an x-ray source and an x-ray detector and power and, and things like that. So this is the type of image that's going to come out of this scanner after 150 milliseconds of scanning. It's a three-dimensional structure. We'll, we'll take a look at it in 3D. Uh, myocardium here, blood pool here in the left ventricle, blood pool in the left atrium, left atrium, left ventricle. This is the right ventricle over here. That is a coronary artery. That's the right coronary artery. Very large, you know, sort of four millimeter diameter, five millimeter diameter uh, artery. And the three views that you're looking at here are perpendicular cuts through the patient's heart. And so this view is called an axial cut. Here's the patient's chest. That's their sternum right there. Lungs, their spine is here, descending aorta. This is the patient's left. This is the patient's right. So we're looking from the patient's feet towards their head. And this is the standard view. You don't mess with this when it comes up you don't want to flip this around, everybody get confused. Although remarkably, there are genetic conditions in which when you look inside the patient, it's completely mirror imaged, right? Their organs, it's pretty cool, right? There must be some little switch there and just grows a mirror image uh, person. Anyway, they're like in a multiverse situation. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> here's the axial cut. If you cut this thing along the blue line here, so this is parallel to the floor, perpendicular to this. You get this picture on the right here. And at, that's called a coronal view. And so we're looking down now from the patients. We're looking from up here down towards the floor, right? And uh, the patient's left side's over here. Their right side's over here. Feet down here, head up here. And you can see a nice view of the aorta exiting the left ventricle. Again, it's a, it's just a 
slice that's five millimeters thick through this patient, right? So all of the features you're seeing here are contained inside that five millimeters, right? Very bright blood, and the reason it's very bright is that contrast agent we injected. So it has iodine in it, which is a very good atom for stopping x-rays. So a lot of x-rays get stopped by the blood pool while that contrast is in there, and you get fantastic uh, contrast between the blood pool and, say, myocardium out here. The contrast between the myocardium and, say, the liver is not very high. I mean, those, those two tissues without contrast agent, they, they absorb x-rays at roughly the same rate, and so you don't get great contrast there. Air, on the other hand, fantastic contrast because x-rays just fly through air. Uh, and this is all vessel uh, vascular structures inside the lungs. If we look at this, uh, say now we're looking down the patient's chest, right towards her back, and we cut the patient from their head right down their feet, right down the middle. And that's called a sagittal view. So that yellow plane is this image. So the patient's chest is up here, their back is down here. We're looking uh, from their right side towards uh, their left side. No, sorry, left side towards their right side with their head up here. And <clears throat> uh, so this is the right part here and left the top of the left ventricle and the atrium. So that's called the sagittal view. In these two views, the sagittal and the coronal view, they're fantastic views for seeing the results of patient breathing because the diaphragm will move up and down and push the heart up and down. And so when you take uh, images and you're looking say at an axial view and you say, man, that image looks crappy, what's going on here? And you go back to this view and you take a few images uh, displaced in time, you will see that the patient was breathing during the acquisition. And so therefore the the data where the axial view is a mixture of different tissues as it moves into the imaging slice. Uh, you get great movies of, of people breathing, right? If you can take enough pictures. The problem with x-ray is you just can't take as many pictures as you want because each picture requires dose and you add up, you know, and you get to a final sort of limit of, of the dose that you want to give any one person. Uh, any questions about that? The voxel size here is about uh, 0.5 by 0.5 by 0.5 millimeters. That's the, when the data is stored digitally, that's what you store, uh, you know, a 16 bit number with that kind of, you know, spacing. The resolution <clears throat> as measured say by the point spread function should be bigger than 0.5, right? If, if that's, you, you want more points than you have resolution, right? You don't want the, the points to, to be holding you back. Uh, but it's a lot of data to store. Well, it's not so much data anymore. It used to be a lot of data to store. Like 10 years ago, that was a lot of data. Uh, now, you know, it's not so bad. When you render all of that data uh, in 3D, so each one of these, this is a series of 360 pictures, and those pictures are created as a 3D rendering. And for each picture, the heart is rotated one degree. And then you just play back 360 pictures as a movie, and it looks like this. So you have to decide on your rendering algorithm because there's an infinite number of ways to render something in 3D that has you know, a different scalar value at each point in space. Right, there's shadowing models and and there's cinematic kind of rendering where the the tissue itself is is a, acting as a light source, uh, things like that. You know, you can get, you can go to town on this. This is really trivial rendering. This is just uh, the Hounsfield unit or the brightness of the pixel is shown up here as as something towards white, and the dark pixels are something towards a dark red. And uh, as you can see, there isn't a lot of shadowing. The lighting model is just kind of a uniform lighting model of that object. So it's almost like this is a cast of the heart. 
and the cast, the plaster that would be the cast is the uh, blood volume. And the blood volume has been filled with this contrast to make it really bright. So really different than the surrounding tissue. So that's why it looks uh, pretty spectacular because things like this really stick out, right? I mean, uh, how do I get rid of this? Uh, now I want to go back to my normal. Is it? Uh, right. Okay. So if we stop, say, here. So you can see a, a really nice depiction of a big caliber vessel, right? This This vessel is, you know, four millimeters, five millimeters in diameter. It's the right coronary artery. And you can even see a branch of the right coronary artery going down here onto, it basically is resting on the surface of the right ventricle. So it's going down the surface of the right ventricle, right? And <clears throat> as we go around to the other, and then so the right coronary artery in this patient comes around and it is the dominant vessel for feeding the posterior wall. So in this view, we're looking from the patient's back up towards their chest. This is the back of the heart here, or the posterior wall. Uh, and, and so the right coronary artery is feeding that. So if you get a big lesion right here, then you're going to lose your posterior wall. So in like a perfusion scan, we'd see a big dark spot on the bottom of the heart there. The other vessel that possibly can feed the posterior wall is this one that comes across here. This is called the circumflex artery, or, and uh, it basically go, wraps around the back of the uh, left ventricle. And if you are a left dominant person, this, this vessel will continue to be thick and come down here, feed the posterior wall. In this patient, obviously the right took over that role. This one just fades away, right? Seems like a waste of, cause it was there when it, when they were an embryo or when they were a little fetus. So <clears throat> this is the left main, obviously exceptionally important chunk of, of coronary vessel right here called the left main. It's coming off the root of the aorta. And when it comes out here, this thing is upwards of seven millimeters wide, big flow goes through there. This, when you do a, a contrast injection and in x-ray, x-ray angiography, you Basically, you bring a catheter down this big pipe, the aorta, and you stick it in there. You just engage the left main and then squirt contrast down there. It breaks into the cirque, and then there's these branching vessels that perfuse the essentially anterior and lateral wall of the left ventricle. Very important because a lot of exercise is being done right here, right? You've got a one beat per second for your entire life, right? How many heartbeats is that? Anybody know? Every time your heart going to beat in your entire life? It's like a billion, you know, so a billion dollars seems like a lot of, that's as many heartbeats as a dollar per beat. That's a billion, <laughs> you know? So, so then you come down here and it goes all the way to the apex, right? And this is called the left anterior descending coronary artery. And it's, it's uh, also very important. If you have a big lesion here, they usually come in and stent it to, to keep the stuff down stream flowing okay so that this all of that data was obtained in 150 milliseconds so nuclear medicine cannot do this echocardiography cannot do this mr doesn't even come close to being able to do this right it is remarkably better <laughs> than all of the other ways to image the heart so when you look at them those vessels in in a sort of a planar view uh, so what we're doing here is <clears throat> we take the 3D data, uh, we take a slab of that data that uh, contains the right coronary artery. And so the, the coronary artery perpendicular to this imaging plane will be going up and down, right? It'll, it'll, be, it'll have a course. So you take that entire slab that contains the artery and you project through the slab and you pick up whatever is the maximum pixel in the entire slab and just project that onto one side. And then this is what you get. This is called a maximum intensity projection of that slab. 
And so you get to see the, you know, sort of the cross-sectional view of the right corner artery from that slab direction, okay? And this is used a lot by uh, radiologists and cardiologists to actually read the coronary angiograms. Uh, this, <clears throat> if we go back to this, this is virtually never used, right? For whatever reason, they, uh, I don't know, they don't really reconstruct these that much. They, excuse me. <clears throat> the, the way this scan is usually used is if they get to these views and things don't look great and they wonder like what went wrong, they'll go back and look at this view and say, is, do I actually have a reasonable data set in front of me? So you get a whole, the entire view all at once. Um, <clears throat> but to make the call and, you know, what is their job? Their, their final job is to go down through every coronary artery and say, does it have a significant stenosis in it? Right. So what is, so my job is to go down here, look at this and say, the right coronary artery is normal. That's my job. Right? So when I make that call and I look at this data, if I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's normal, you need to call it normal. And <clears throat> cardiac CT is extraordinarily good at that. So when you're called normal on cardiac CT, it's very rare that you're abnormal, right? So that's, it's got great specificity, right? So when you, when you have a negative call, yeah. Absolutely. That is absolutely true. So if you, start thinking, you know, I should quantify what this vessel looks like as a function of distance down the vessel. Many software packages exist so that you can put key points, if you want, along the vessel, and it will stretch it out and then map, sort of, it will give you a map of what's in that vessel. And we'll see in, in vessels that have lesions, it, it's kind of useful to do that sometimes. I've used a lot of that software over the last 10 years. I quit using it maybe nine, seven years ago because it was all junk. I mean, it was all just guess, right? It, you know, they would say, oh, this is a 40% fat plaque. And you look at it and go, well, good for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, just, it was just a guess, right? And so the, but since then, uh, there have been, you know, hundreds of thousands of CT coronary exams and outcomes, right? So you, you wait 10 years and you say, what happens to this patient? Did they finally have an MI or some kind of dramatic cardiac event? And uh, deep learning has taken the data that, you know, was uh, manually segmented and manually characterized and categorized and learned how to do it. And so now it can be done really quickly, reproducibly. Like the great thing about deep learning is at least it's the same person every time. It's not a person, the same you know, robot every time. It's going to give you consistent answers. So you can start building up consistency in how things happen. Um, humans, on the other hand, from one to the next, it's, it's all bets are off, right? So, so you see, here's the right coronary coming from the root of the aorta. LAD coming down here with all of these gorgeous branches resolved with these projection views. Uh, it almost looks fake, right? It looks like it's on a, an unnaturally good image compared to all the rest of the scanning views. Um, so <clears throat> those are those are normal vessels. We'll take a look at some what abnormal vessels look like in a minute. Getting back to the CT itself. <clears throat> so I started in medical imaging somewhere around here, right? After I got out of undergrad and uh, MR had, had just hit the scene here. And so CT's down here at about, you know, 7 million cases a year. Is this just, uh, oftentimes this data is just Medicare. I don't know. This, look, this looks like the total U.S. numbers. 
And the problem was, you know, it had uh, technical limitations in that it was slow. The dose was very high. A lot of x-rays were used, right? And so you really had, there had to be a lot of motivation for using the CT scanner for whatever it is you're looking at. But back here, if you were in a car wreck or something and you came in and you had pain and all that stuff, damn, you got a CT, right? Because you could see exactly what was going on, right? Even though the dose was really high and it took a long time. As helical CT, and we'll understand what that is in a second, came on, at all of a sudden you could do many more cases per hour and uh, the acquisition time was a lot faster. So the usage started going up linearly after this. <clears throat> and then around here, they decided it was a good idea to put CT scanners stacked one on top of the other. So instead of one slice, well, why, why not just have one slice? Let's do four slices at a time. And so their array became, instead of a thousand by one, it became a thousand by four, then a thousand by eight, then 16, 64. Now we have 320, right? So it's like 320 CTs all stacked on top of each other. And so when that happened, you know, the use of this thing just skyrocketed because it took a, as I was saying, it took 150 milliseconds. The images were absolutely clear. The, the time to do it was really low. And so it was crazy not to get a CT in many, in many uh, situations. And this data only goes out to 2008. It probably doesn't continue to grow, you know, on, on this line, but it, it goes off a little bit. So multi-detector CT, very simple concept. Engineering-wise, not, not a trivial thing to do because of the amount of information you have to get out of the scanner and packing the, the uh, detectors together. So it's, but it's simple, right? You just stack them. And so now your detector is a 2D detector instead of a, a single detector. Um, and we'll see there are some artifacts associated with having something that's a really wide detector because the beams come out at, at different angles, you know, depending on where your source is. So now a detector looks like this. It's called a, <coughs> a cone beam detector. Originally we had, you know, uh, a 1D detector with a fan angle, it was called. Uh -oh. <coughs> and uh, now 64 is kind of the minimum you see these days in this direction in the Z axis. And it's still usually about a thousand detectors in this, in this direction, right? So we have this cone angle and the fan angle and the, the uh, Z dimension. The geometry of the whole thing is you have a big X-ray flashlight up here, X-ray tube. Um, the approximately one meter, you know, bore inside that bore, like the bore would be out here. Inside that you have a volume that you get good scanning data that's covered with the detector. So if an X-ray comes out of the tube, right, there's a certain circle over which the detector will be able to see those uh, photons. Um, and, you know, the, traditionally the, this, this is probably 55 to 60 centimeters. The, the, you know, the diameter of the maximum field of view you could reconstruct is something like that. Um, the detector array itself, most of the time is something that rotates with the source. And so the whole gantry rotates around. You can imagine you could have uh, different uh, geometries, right? You could have multiple sources and multiple detectors, which Siemens has. Uh, you could have a fixed detector array that was always there, always around, right? So you didn't rotate the detector array. However, uh, unless you have multiple sources, a lot of those detectors are unnecessary. They're not going to be catching any photons other than scattered ones. Um, there was a very interesting early fast CT scanner called an Imitron scanner. And this was even in the early 80s, these came out, uh, where this detector array was fixed around 
And what happened was there was a, the way you make x-rays is you hit electrons onto a metallic target. And when the electron accelerates with a collision, an x-ray is released, right? It's called Bremsstrahlung uh, radiation. So instead of having the target inside a tube like this, they had a, a ring target around with the whole geometry. And then instead of this beam just inside the tube, they had a linear electron accelerator that hit the target as a function of, of theta. They took the beam and they just hit the target all the way around. And they could do that very rapidly. So they could zip around there in 100 milliseconds, right? And so you could make essentially a source that is rotating around the patient in you know, 100 milliseconds. Did very well for a while, Imitron. Um, but then the gantries and the multi-slices and everything just kind of caught up to it. And, and it became a technology that was limited because of the spatial resolution. It's hard to make a really tight electron beam to hit the target and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's the geometry. Here it is rotating, right? So the source rotates with the detector. Um, the one thing you can also do is if you, if, here's our source up here. I have no idea what this iconic little party hat is on there. I don't know what that represents, <laughs> but anyway, this is our X-ray source. Okay, and uh, in front of, so there's sort of a uniform flux of, it's, it's relatively uniform flux of x-rays are coming from the source. However, you can imagine that if this is the basic shape of your patient, right? It's like a physicist patient, it's a sphere. Um, the x-ray uh, essentially flux that you need to get through the entire patient and then have a decent number of photons hit your detector is different down the middle of the bore than it is out at the sides, right? So my x-ray beams that are coming here, on average, depending on the patient and everything, are gonna go through less stuff out here. And so you're gonna have a bigger number of photons hitting your detector here. So it gives you a bit of a issue in the sense that two things, if, if my photon beam is coming like this and it misses the patient entirely, and I want an accurate number on my detector here, which is many orders of magnitude higher than this one, I need a detector that has this remarkable dynamic range, right? And that's expensive to, to make and kind of unnecessary because what we can do is we put in front of the source this thing called a bow tie filter, and it lets... It's very narrow or very small right on the center line, and it's very thick out here so that the photons that come out of the detector out here go through more material before they go through the patient. You know precisely what that bow tie filter is. You can take a picture of it. And so therefore you normalize the dynamic range on your detector. So these get essentially dropped uh, so you can encode them in fewer bits, right, over the dynamic range of, of your all your raw data. So uh, it also, you don't need as many photons to get through the patient here. So bombarding the patient with more photons out here is just getting more dose, right? So you may as well equalize it. And that's, every, every scanner has bow tie filters, usually a couple of them. This one has three. So if you, if you have a very large object in the scanner, like a patient's chest and the patient is a very large patient, then you open up that bow tie filter to get a lot of x-rays across the, the whole patient. If on the other hand, you're doing a head, right? Or you have a, a small person, right? Then you can use a smaller uh, bow tie filter. And in fact, we, we wrote a couple of papers a few years ago with a postdoc in the lab where we looked at cardiac imaging even though you've got a really big patient, you only want great data on their heart, right? And it's a small field of view. And so there is really no reason to have data across their whole chest if you, you're not even gonna look at the pixels out there. So what you can do is you can narrow this thing right down so that it just contains the heart and drop your dose by close to a factor of two and, 
and granted you're you have don't have superb ability to to uh, reconstruct the pixels outside this sweet spot, but enough such that they don't contaminate the values inside, right? And so that that's like a select field of view or limited field of view uh, tomography. So those things are in there. You can't switch them dynamically in a, just a standard scanner. You have to decide ahead of time and you put it and it goes clonk clonk and it gets into place. So the basic uh, signal that we're going to detect, we can parameterize this position along here as detector number. Or we can parameterize it with a continuous value L, we'll say, along this way. And we're going to, for any 2D image we're going to make, we'll take a projection view at this angle. We'll rotate both detector and source to a new angle and take a new projection. And we'll do that about a thousand times. Usually about as many detectors as if you have along here, that's about how many angles you want to use, some on that order. So you're going to get a thousand of these. And what are these data? They are one dimensional data. If we're just looking at 2D scanning, we're not looking in the Z direction right now. And <clears throat> so here's our position on the detector. This is the intensity of x-rays that we detect. Remember, an x-ray is going to come, th go through the patient. It'll either be attenuated or not. And then it'll hit uh, a little crystal thing that will cause a flash. And then, the and then a photodiode will convert that to a, a voltage and you read that voltage out. For the most part, um, everything we're gonna talk about in this course, we're gonna talk about energy integrating detectors. So everything that hits that detector just gets added up into one flash. We don't pay any attention to the energy of the X-ray that came out of the patient. This as long as it can create a flash, right? That's, we're gonna call that a binary event. Um, modern or more modern CT scanners, Every manufacturer now has a way to actually detect the energy of the X-ray as it hits the detector. At least put it in an energy bucket. So most of them use like three or four energy buckets. So you've got a high, two medium, and one low energy. And, and so if you do that, it, it affords you the opportunity to minimize your scatter grid for the reasons we talked about with PET right? You, you might want to just eliminate things below a certain energy because they, they're just uh, scattered photons. Um, and it also allows you to create a multi-dimensional picture. So you can create a picture of your patient when they're irradiated with photons above 120 kV or between 100 to 120, et cetera. So high energy photons, medium, low energy photons. You can also make pictures that are representative of how much water is in the, the patient. You, you actually project your data onto the water access uh, in terms of the amount of attenuation that's accumulated. So it's pretty cool, yeah. So traditionally, what makes these projections that measuring photon counts? Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that they're now able to do counts and energy. And energy, yeah. So it's like having four scanners. One is operating at high, one's medium high, one's medium low and low. So you have that other dimension of, of detector. Yeah. So that's called, uh, you know, sort of photon counting CT. That's our PCCT, photon counting. What we are doing here is called energy integration CT, which is just brightness uh, or a number of photons that hit the detector, right? It's important because the noise in CT comes from two major sources. One is electronic noise on all the electronics, right? So you've got random thermal noise in electronics. So if you have no signal, you'll still have hash coming down your amplifier. But the main source of noise when you're doing low dose imaging is uncertainty in the number of photons that hit the detector. 
because once you get down to five or 10, you know, anywhere from like three to 15 photons in that zone, you it's Poisson statistics. So it, it's it just through the statistical process itself, you get high variability inside that, that um, range of photons. If you're detecting 50 photons, it'll be a Gaussian, you know, and you do that a thousand times, you'll get a Gaussian histogram around 50 with the mean, and it'll be pretty tight. When you go down to 10, it's a Poisson distribution and it's, it's pretty broad, right? So as a percent, it's pretty broad. And so that is the main source of noise in a CT image. A low dose CT image is the uncertainty in the number of photons that were collected. Um, here, this graph, this thing here, represents basically how many photons hit my detector as a function of position along here. So if we look at the example that's in the scanner here, uh, and we ask, well, for a beam of x-rays that's coming perfectly, you know, vertically down uh, through the patient, how many photons do we expect to see here? Well, we don't expect to see very many, right? Get it through the patient. And the reason is there is the spine right here. So there's a lot of bone that it has to get through. There's the sternum up here. So that's even more bone. And if there's contrast inside the patient, you know, if it's passing through the uh, descending aorta, it's going to get a lot of absorption. So literally coming out the back of the patient can be a trickle of photons at, on this beam. So just a few, right? Whereas out here, if I'm just going through this chest tissue right here and that's it, I'll get a very high count of photons. And so this profile is our raw data for that's going to be used to reconstruct the, the image where <clears throat> the raw data is the intensity as a function of position along the detector. Rotate the source and the detector. And now the position of that really low count moves, you know, it was in the middle of the detector here. When I rotate the detector, it moves, here's the bone here, over to here. So when I plot that profile, I see that feature on this side, right? And so here's my uh, intensity as a function of detector position. The detector over here, these are just coming through straight air. They haven't seen anything, right? So it's basically the, the intensity that comes out of the X-ray tube is, is hitting your, and so that you know maxes out your uh, dynamic range over here. Two major uh, ways to scan a large field of view in the superior to inferior direction. Remember the patient, unless they're in a very strange orientation on the table, their feet, the head direction is usually the way the table slides back and forth. And <clears throat> if you want to image the entire body, you can't do it by just sticking the patient in. Obviously you don't have enough coverage in Z. And so the two ways to get around that are spiral scan and this is called uh, step and shoot, basically. So you can rotate once, take, a, take an image of some Z slab, right? Then move the table and do that process again, and then move the table and do that process again, right? And so that's called step and shoot. You'll get a stack. They're usually overlapped a little bit, those stacks, and then you just you just make a 3D volume uh, by putting those stacks together. A more continuous three-dimensional uh, imaging uh, technique is called spiral scan. And this, or helical scan, uh, this was introduced by Siemens early on. Um, what we saw in that graph, this was where the, that first inflection of growth occurred in, in the business. Uh, and <clears throat> As you can imagine, the electronics in the early days, you know, you needed you needed a cable going into your detector to get the, the voltage measurements back out onto your computer, and you needed power going into your 
x-ray source, right? And so <clears throat> in the early days, those cables, they had to rotate the source in the detector, say 180 degrees and then stop, rotate them back and do it again. Uh, because you, you couldn't just continuously wind these cables up, right? And so that is one of the reasons why step and shoot is the preferred method for a long time. You would rotate, and then as you're moving the patient, you rotate it back and then do it again and do it again. Siemens came up with this technique where they had um, brushes on what was called a slip ring. So you had multiple small rings around and then a brush came out and was on each ring. And then you would essentially send data across you know, uh, that connection as the gantry was spinning. So now if you've got that slip ring technology, you don't have to rewind the scanner. You can just keep it spinning, right? <clears throat> Interesting point also is, well, now that I'm spinning, why don't I just spin twice as fast? And then you get it twice as fast. Well, why don't I spin twice as fast as that? <laughs> so eventually you get up to these rates in which the thing is spinning really fast. And so now the the fastest I think is about five hertz. So you have a big thing spinning five times a second, right? And the G-force on the electronics, like the X-ray source, the power supply, the detector, they're all out at a fairly high radius, right? They're at 80 Gs. So now you got another engineering like boundary condition. It's like, oh yeah, and then all of these things have to survive 80 Gs, right, for extended periods. <laughs> so it's a pretty solid piece of equipment. Like when you when you take the skins off and you look at it. And so now you can spin this thing really fast and then just push the patient through continuously and acquire data continuously, right? And that's called helical scanning. And so <clears throat> you obviously never have a position where you have a fixed slice of data. What you have to do with the helical data is stored in a computer, you know what angle you're at, and then for any position in the patient, you interpolate the value, right, from the two helices on either side of that position, right, the projections on either side. And obviously there's, you can push the patient slowly and you get a very high sampling rate in Z, you push the patient very fast and you get a low sampling rate in Z. And that's a decision you have to make, you know, what is your Z resolution uh, for that? Um, here's where CT started with Hounsfield and all those like, uh, you know, founders of this field. <clears throat> the first scanner that was produced, it made an 80 by 80 head image. It could only image heads because it was a fairly small thing. And it took 20 minutes for it to raster through all the data and get the reconstruction done. And then the black line here is Moore's law. And then these, the red dots, this is Norbert Pelk made this graph. He was at GE, uh, GE uh, Medical, probably since here actually, uh, around here. <clears throat> and that's the rate at which, you know, you're getting raw data points per second. Right, so it just tracks as Moore's law, and um, as you can, you know, basically sample that data off of your detector, you can make better and better pictures. Uh, until now, we're at this point. We're on a Canon system. This is the most slices available right now. The GE has two fifty six. Um, Siemens has. Uh, basically 128, but they do some interesting interpolation to get it to 256, so they're all above the same. But in the in-plane, you, you have 512 by 512 images, and we've discussed that. And you know he's saying here every 0.28, which is a full 360 degrees of data. Um, so you know every third of a second, you're getting, you're getting this many pixels being spit out of this machine, right? So it's pretty spectacular in terms of the rate. The 
Canon, the people that do this 320, they they really bit off a really big, you know, chunk and said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna make our detector elements on our detector twice as small. So they reduced the dimension of their detectors by a factor of two in both the detector direction, like in the in the L direction along the, I'll go back to the detector, in this direction. So most people have about a thousand. They said, well, let's put two thousands with half the dimension. And we'll also do that in Z. So they have a quarter of the area. And the images that come out of there are pretty spectacular. Uh, so they, you know, they have to display their images at 1K by 1K, essentially. Um, and it's, and the slice thickness is, you know, 0.25 or something. It's, it's, I'll show you a couple. So this is the GE uh, revolution scanner that we got here. We got this when I came in 2015 or 16, something like that. That's how fast it spins, right? It makes a lot of noise, unfortunately. It's, it's not, it's not distressing for me, but it's distressing actually sometimes for patients, like when the thing spins up, it's, and so here's the detector array. There's 256 in this direction, about 900 in this direction on that order. Uh, you can cone down the x-rays if you, if you want to do a, a smaller field of view here. What happens is this maps to, if you look at the geometry here, here's the patient, right? So the Z direction here, halfway between say the source and the detector right here in the middle, you can cover 16 centimeters, right? So that's a, that's a pretty good chunk, right? And, and basically that means you can get the entire heart. So for us, for cardiovascular, we get the entire heart all in one shot. We don't have to move the patient in this scanner. With uh, the semen scanner, you do have to move the patient. You have to do at least two steps or oftentimes they, they do a helical acquisition uh, because their detector is shorter in this dimension. But we'll see, they traded that off for putting two of the darn detectors in the scanner, right? So see, that's pretty cool. This is the x-ray tube, and they've just introduced a new x-ray tube, which we're going to get in a few months. And as you can imagine, as the thing speeds up, right, you, you need a higher flux of x-rays. Because let's say it took us half a second five years ago to this, maybe this thing spun at half a second. So integrate up all of the x-rays out of a tube in half a second. And that's how many you're working with to get 360 degrees of data. Now let's go down to 0.2 seconds. And if you, unless you change your x-ray tube, you're gonna kind of run out of x-rays, right? Cause you, you've got a certain rate at which the x-rays are coming out of the tube. So now they've made these super powerful x-ray tubes that uh, can give you enough x-rays as a burst in order to get it all done in 150 milliseconds, right? This is the power supply for creating the voltage across the uh, cathode anode pair, like the cathode electrons burn off the cathode or acceler accelerated across a gap between the cathode and the anode. And you know the amount of current and the amount of uh, electrons they can get coming out of there uh, are generated by this old power so source here. Um, and the interesting thing about this uh, x-ray tube is that you can switch between voltages on that cathode anode pair in sort of the kilohertz range. So you can switch that voltage between say 70 kilovolts between them up to 140 kilovolts between them and you can switch back and forth at you know kilo you know sort of kilohertz and so if you do that switching while you're going around the patient you basically get two pictures you get one at the lower energy at the 70 you know electron uh, kilo electron volt uh x-rays so that's their maximum energy and interdigitated with that is an image i'd say 140. so those two pictures look quite different 
right? And so now you have this two-dimensional uh, multi-energy type of, of image. You'd think that would have transformed uh, the, the business. Uh, however, it, it, it turns out it doesn't have a, a ton of applications. <laughs> You know, is a, it has less, fewer than you would imagine, but anyway. Um, this is what it looks like when it was being installed. Uh, this is at our place. So here we have the current x-ray tube up here, the power supply, lots of electronics and fans and all this kind of junk. And then the detectors down here. And uh, this whole thing, everything you see here spins at this very high rate, right? I would recommend going on to YouTube and type in spinning CT scanner or something like that. It's, there's, a, there's tons of people who've just taken movies. They take the skins off the scanner and turn it on. And you can see how fast the Siemens scanner spins and the GE, et cetera. So, uh, oh, wow. Is it, it's time. Are we done? Oh, no, sorry. I can't see the clock very well. Okay, what, what time are we at? Uh, okay, now we got 20 minutes. Okay, good. Just looked up there and was like, what? Okay. Um, okay, so here's the detector or one part of the detector for this scanner. And I think I have a, a better video. Jamstone, I think this will run. Oh, it does. Awesome. So here's the detector. And this is the Z direction. Okay, this way, so you can see it's fairly extended in the in the Z direction. Uh, if we go back, just so you get oriented better here. Right, so here's the detector. It's gonna be spinning around there. Uh, and then they come in sort of blocks where <clears throat> this is the Z direction, right? And these little chips here, have an array of dexels or detector points on them. Uh, and then this is the anti-scatter grid here, right? And then they stack, you know, I don't know, there's like 30 of them or something in this dimension uh, with about 32 in each one of these units would be like 32 pixels across this way. And then you stack say 30 of them up to, to get your whole detector array. Um, and so here's the detector elements themselves. So this would be about 30 by, I don't know, 16 in this direction. And uh, there's one, two, three, four. So there's eight of them this way, right? Uh, and inside each one of these would have 16 uh, detectors. The thing that just flew off is the anti-scatter grid that has to be a two-dimensional anti-scatter grid because you have scatter in Z and scatter in the... Uh, theta direction or along the, the full detector, right? And the reason this is called gemstone is they made some material inside each one of these that when it fluoresces, when it detects an X-ray, the fluorescence itself is very quick. So the decay rate on the fluorescence is, is super fast. And so you can... Um, essentially page data out that's independent at a, at a very high rate on this detector. Uh, and so that matches the technology that they use to do multi-energy, which is this switching between energies so that they can do that. So here's one of the little chips with all the data coming off and the preamps are all, all in here. And <clears throat> So it's all just snaps together like Lego, right? It's great. Let's see what we got going on here. And so here's the anti-scatter grid that has a, a Z component as well as the uh, XY component, okay? And then it snaps all together. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so if you, uh, what I did here was 
I didn't have anything in the scanner, right? So there's nothing absorbing x-rays and you just take an image, right? And then, you know, the data itself is in some kind of encoded form. However, you can, if you know what you're looking at, you can decode it and take a look at what is the signal that's, that's on those detectors. It's in a raw data file that you can just download off the scanner. So then you have to go through that raw data file and find the patterns that show you, oh, okay, this is real raw data. This is just other stuff that they're putting in. <clears throat> and then decode the amplitude of the signal in their real raw data to the actual photon counts, right? Not trivial, but possible. Because CT manufacturers will not tell you anything, right? Unless you have some extraordinarily special agreement with them which only a handful of people have out in academia, they prefer to keep everything in house. And in fact, a lot of stuff they don't patent, they just have trade secrets, right? And because you patent it, it's out in the public domain basically, and then somebody can just run off and build their own scanner like that. So anyway, here's what signal. So all I did is turn on the X-ray source, right? This is the number, the intensity of x-rays that were on the detector when nothing was in the scanner for you know, one frame, one, one view. And so here you can see that detector array that we just saw, right? There was basically <clears throat> each one of these uh, two by eight units is like one of those chunks that, were, that when there was, a, or was it four? I can't remember, maybe it's four. Uh, and you can see that inside those themselves, there is some kind of gain difference from one patch to the next, right? And it could be, there's a lot of things that could cause that. It could be the batch, you know, that these crystals were in, they're all in the same batch that they made. Or it could be that this preamp is just a little bit off, you know, compared to the other preamps around it. There is obviously a loss of signal at the place where these those little chips that we saw got put in. So there's there's a decrease in signal on the border uh, pixels of those, et cetera. So there's a lot of features here, right? What this should look like is a uniform background, right? If this is this is our transmitted X-ray field hit by on the detector. So the transmitted X-rays ideally would be uniform this would be uniform. It's obviously not uniform. It's brighter here than it is out here. And now this isn't the whole detector from one end to the next. It's This is the center, obviously. And then uh, we go out to one end this way. This is cut off. <clears throat> uh, and then as you, you say, okay, a lot, of, a lot of photons hit the center part. And as I go out to the edge, the number of photons hitting rolls off. That's the bow tie filter. Right, so that is basically, you got this bow tie on and it's saying, I'm gonna put fewer photons out in the periphery than in the middle. You know, analytically what that function is so you can just normalize that out, right? That's number one. Number two, it looks like there's a gradient from here down to here. This is the um, uh, one edge of the detector and this is the other. Two things might have happened here. One is maybe this is offset a little bit in the scanner, I don't know, but I doubt it. No, what this most likely is, is the fact that when you have a target, so I have an electron beam, it hits my target and X-rays splash, splash away from that target. The X-rays that are directly under the target Basically, in this area here, you will see fewer x-rays because the x-rays generated inside the target in depth in the metal had to get out of the metal, right? And so the ones that, the x-rays that are over here just came straight away from the target. They didn't have to travel through much metal to get out of the target. And this is called the heel effect. So you have a higher attenuation of your source directly under the target where those x-rays have to move through the metal of the target. And it's called heel effect. Again, it's pretty obvious with CT, you're going to need to 
every morning, take a scan like this and normalize your data to this thing, right? And so that's what's done is that you calibrate the scanner and you normalize the amount of attenuation you see to this picture, right? That's called an air scan. And if you want to do any kind of experiment on the scanner to try and reconstruct something, you need to put that thing in the scanner, then take it out and just do an air scan and then normalize it to this, right? The raw data for every patient that's done during the day carries in it an air scan. And it was the air scan that was obtained that morning usually, right? And so it's, a, it's part of CT that, that you have to do. When I watch them calibrate the scanner, when it, you run the calibration, right, and you just see, well, what's this, what is the scanner doing right now? It moves through energies on the X-ray beam as as well. So it does this time and picture for many different energies. So there's obviously something in the energy sensitivity of the detectors that it needs to know as well to do corrections. Right? Um, however, uh, if you want to reconstruct perfect pictures, you either have to take your raw data back to the scanner and it does all those corrections, or you have to know somebody in the company who knows how to do those corrections. You can get pretty close. Right? Um, and then this is the anti-scatter grid. This is a, uh, a display case. They have it at uh, GE in Milwaukee. And in the display case is one unit of the anti-scatter grid with some uh, stuff, balls of stuff. Here, I'll show you underneath it. Like, I mean, so these things are underneath there. See the, the cylinder and the ball and stuff like that. And then when you look through, you can see at certain angles, they just disappear, right? And so basically, it, unless you're at the perfect angle, the thing's going to disappear. The reason why multiple copies, you know, it, it it appears and reappears, like here it is straight on. All of these other things like that is just reflections through the the light pipe. It's just light bouncing off the, off the pipe. But X-rays would just get absorbed. Of those those things, right? So that unless you're right on the money, like here, and you're an X-ray, you're going to get absorbed. So that's the anti-scatter grid. Um, and then here is uh, a 3D image, uh, much like that heart that we, we saw, you know, spinning. But this is a phantom that we made uh, in order to investigate uh, some stuff. It, mostly, this project was investigating what we could do to try and minimize the artifact coming off of pacing leads in the heart, which is kind of, it's a problem. Sometimes you get this big artifact coming off pacing leads. So we built a little phantom. These are two commercial pacing leads. This phantom was in a 3D printed, um, sort of a, it's like a cycloid in this direction, but it's full, this is the cap and it's full of a contrast agent, right? Uh, and the reason I'm using it here is because I'm going to show you next for this object what the raw data looks like. And so this is the full detector now. Okay, so Z is this direction. This is in the theta direction of the L direction along the detector in this direction. And then these are the views that were obtained to make that 3D picture. Okay. And so it's pretty simple. So that thing there is the patient table. Right, or this is actually our phantom. That's why it's it's uh, absorbing a lot of X-rays. It's the the table upon which this thing rested because we, we move it sometimes. But you can see a couple of effects. One is bright X-rays here, and they get darker as we go out here from the the bow tie, right? And very high attenuation along the pacing leads because they're metallic. And so just below the pacing lead, you see very few photons hit the detector and you get a small value here. Out here in air, uh, we get a high value for the number of photons that hit our detector. Once you're, you're in this kind of dynamic range and you're visualizing it, 
you can see that the, all of those features we saw on the detector elements kind of disappear into the background. So they're not huge amplitude features, but they make a difference. You still have to uh, do that uh, correction. So if we ask, well, what, how many photons do we see? What's the intensity at a specific point, say here or here? Um, you know, how, do, how is that modeled? Well, you have this equation is really simple in that you have a intensity that comes out of the X-ray tube and is on that trajectory that goes from the source to this detector point. So intensity at detector D. D just takes on a value from, so it's like 256 by a thousand, right? There's that many detector points. And so I'm gonna have, just label each one and ask, well, what is, What's the intensity of that one? So it's the intensity that was going towards that before it started going through the, the materials. And then you just add up all of the attenuation coefficients in the direction along that line. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at this in a, with a better diagram. But it's, it's quite simple, right? In that the, the amount of attenuation occurs is just the line integral of the attenuation coefficients along that line as you pass through the sample. And then if you normalize that, so here's what we measured on our detector. I naught is what we have in our air scan, right? So we have an air scan that says, this is what it would be if, if it was just pure air. Uh, and we take that from this side of the equation, divide it, take the log. We now have, you know, a, or basically a real number. And uh, this, this number is always smaller than I naught. So this log of this is always negative. So put a negative here. This is always a positive number, positive floating point number here. It is equal to this line integral. So now the exponential is gone, right? So I just have a bunch of real numbers and they're equal to this line integral. And so that forms my raw data uh, for doing this. So it also changes the polarity of the numbers so that where, where there is a bright signal here means there has been a lot of attenuation, right? Because this is a, a larger negative number, right? Basically where there's a lot of attenuation, this becomes a larger positive number. So this now becomes a bright signal, this, this function here. And it has L in this direction, Z in this direction. And then I have many of them parameterized by theta. And that's just the theta is just moving around now. Right? Uh, so that's our raw data uh, for, for, and this, this is true raw data from a, a patient's heart, as you can see, right? And you can see the entire heart is contained inside that raw data quite nicely. Here's the liver, the apex of the heart's down here. Atria would be up here, and this is right at the top of the heart. So that field of view, um, you get the entire heart. The tech normally looks at a projection view through the patient, sort of at this, at this angle, and draws lines here and here, or puts a cursor here that has a box and just puts the box around the heart. And then you scan from there, right? Uh, the only thing you can go bad is the patient can be breathing so, so that the heart moves out of your field of view. Um, normally you give them breathing instructions. The scanner actually has it recorded. So when you press scan, it, it asks the patient to hold their breath and then, and then you shoot. And then when you look at the data that comes out, it looks something, or the, after it's reconstructed, uh, it looks like this, right? So these are, these slices are, I believe, yeah, they're half millimeter uh, in thickness. That doesn't mean that the resolution in Z is a half millimeter, but the slices that I'm paging through here are a half millimeter. So the, you know, the fun thing to do is if you're a physician and you're, th this is exactly how they read these. They, they go up and down like this. They, at their console, they look at this data like exactly what you're looking at now. And so we'll say, well, do we have anything happening in this patient's, you know, left main? So here's the aorta, 
this big old vessel coming off here is the left main. And they'll just page up and down through that and say, oh, well, it doesn't look like there's anything that interesting in there, except right here, there's a chunk of calcium where this circumflex is taking on. And then here, we came from the left main out into the LAD, which is gonna go down the front of the heart here. There's a big chunk of calcium along here, right? And let's track that down. Oh, it gets really big right here. There's a lot of calcium here now. So the question is, this goes back to your point. Instead of just zooming up and down here with a cursor, shouldn't we stretch this vessel out and look at it as a function of position down, down the vessel and ask questions like, well, how big is the lesion? How many lesions are there? Where are they? That kind of thing that you could uh, coordinate. Uh, for the most part, uh, clinicians have learned to read these doing what I'm doing now, and they just go from one vessel location to the next and categorize what's happening in there, right? And uh, there's a great game. And so you can see down here where branches of the LAD are coming off. There's more uh, calcium activity. So there have been lesions there in the past if they're not there now. Uh, and... The interesting thing about this is you, you look at this chunk of the LAD and it looks like it's full of calcium, right? So in the early days of CT, this would have been called strongly positive, i.e. that could be a severe lesion. That patient goes to the cath lab and they inject dye and it's mild, right? So the, the calcium actually gets in the way of the CT diagnosis. It's a problem. And... If there is a main problem with CT, it is the fact that inexperienced people will overcall these, these pictures. And so you get too many false positives. That's the, that's the problem. That's changing uh, with deep learning and experience and stuff like that. But as you can see, you go way down here. This is right on the basically anterior wall of the heart. We've got this small vessel, this big one, this big one here. And so all of these vessels are, are moving down. We can watch the right coronary go around here. It's pretty small, right? So one assumes that the, so this is the right coronary out here, right ventricle, and this is in that groove. It's kind of a small vessel, so pro probably not the dominant posterior vessel. Here it is here on the back. And you can see why that um, ability to do the, uh, Maximum intensity projections is good because it, if you don't do it, you have very small chunks of coronary and you have to go up and down. If you do the maximum intensity projection, you can see a big, a bigger field of view in the three slice direction. So that's that's the data that these are read out uh, pretty quickly by very if they're very experienced. And there's this game they play at the SCCT where it's like. Uh, a Jeopardy. You get a Jeopardy question if you are the one who calls the case first correctly. And so they bring the case up and literally these guys do this. They they look at it. The case comes up that goes, case three. And they go like this. And they go, okay, it's a major thing in the, in the right coronary artery and this in the LAD. Literally, they do it in three seconds. Like they've done so many, they just like, they themselves are AI engines. So it's pretty cool. All right, we'll stop there and pick it up on, when we're on Wednesday, on Monday. Uh, so remember the homework, because we got shifted off, is due tonight. Um, and uh, I'll post up the, the next homework uh, to be due next week. I've, so far, I've got three teams to find, so I need two more. Uh, and if you can just email that, that would be uh, terrific. Um, okay, see you Monday. You guys have any questions online or anything or we good? We good? Um, actually, uh, since no one else is on the chat anymore, uh, I was just wondering um, if you